So morning everybody, my name's Kate um, and yeah, as um, Eleanor said, I work um, independently um, but I've had the pleasure to work with a number of you and um, for those of you that I've worked with extensively this may be a um, very, very familiar conversation. Today I, I'm here in sort of capacity as a warm-up act for Robin um, Hewings from the Campaign to End Loneliness who I'm currently working with on a project called Loneliness in the Time of Covid that Robin's going to talk about but my brief is to talk to you a little bit about I guess the sort of years of, of learning and research on loneliness that I think um, we can draw on as we start to think about how to address loneliness um, and promote connection in, in future years. And obviously this is the Connection Coalition. I'm gonna be talking about loneliness, which is obviously, uh, you know, in some ways the, the opposite and what happens when connection isn't there. Um, so let's crack on. Iona, you're my click lady. Um, so uh, the really, really important bit of framing, I think is, is that we recognize what loneliness is and isn't. And the first key point about loneliness is it's a subjective experience and it's about the mismatch between the relationships that I want and the ones that I have. So it's completely personal to me and um, it isn't about an objective count of my social connect connections or contacts. And so I can't dose it um, for every individual the same. I think it's also really important that the definition of loneliness gives space for solitude. It's fine sometimes to want to be alone. And I think that's really important. And, um, you know, I think it's really critical that we get that across. We're not trying to stop everyone being alone. We're trying to help give people a sense of satisfaction with the connections that they have, both in terms of their quality and their quantity. We know quite a lot about risk factors for loneliness and we know that they're a combination of the things that are intrinsic to us as humans, our personality, our character, our intrinsic characteristics, and also the things that are happening around us, our environment, the things that happen to us through our lives, the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And so on the next slide, we've got a summary. This, um, this is a summary of the risk factors that are evidence as, um, as leading to increased risk of loneliness among older adults but actually the risk factors are very similar across all age groups so um there are critical issues around oh we've gone ahead um there are critical issues around things like gender and um sexual orientation um our ethnicity but also features around our education level and income and housing tenure which are often quite interlinked and proxies for one another and critically our health status and whether we're a carer or in need of and support services so there are some really um key things that we can use to identify when and who is most at risk of loneliness and as i said this um, particular slide was created around the evidence base for older adults but the risk factors are very similar if we click onto the next slide i just wanted to mention something about this whole debate about who is most lonely and when now there's obviously a set of data that we're currently um, building up around what is happening around levels of loneliness during this particular period. But right through history, actually, we can talk about epidemics of loneliness, we talk about a loneliness surge, but actually there's a fairly consistent rate of the loneliness that is most worrying, which is the loneliness that is experienced chronically when people are often or always lonely. And among older adults, that's about 10% of people over 65, roughly over time, have been often or always lonely. And we can set up this competition and we've got quite unhealthy about it in my view and saying oh but young people are showing higher levels of loneliness well maybe or it might be a little bit about how we design surveys but actually what we can see through life is a bit of a u-shaped curve so we seem to be have a period of risk of loneliness in early um, adulthood and, and late teens early adulthood and then a period of risk of loneliness in later life and these are times when we're going through lots and lots of transitions and changes in life and so I am much more interested in how transition, change, shift, disconnection gives us risk of loneliness, because I think that's a much more interesting and telling way of looking at it. And of course, it's true that those are times of, of real transition where multiple changes in our lives layer on top of one another. Now, right now in COVID, it looks a bit like young people are experiencing a higher kind of uptick in their loneliness levels than older adults are. And the thing I would say about this is, is we come back to this point about loneliness is about the relationships that we want and those we have and about our expectations of our relationships. And if you think about the lives that older adults have, many older adults have lived and how much those have changed compared to the lives that many young people have uh, been living and how those have changed that might be telling us something about why we're seeing that higher uptick among young people but as I say personally I find it quite unhelpful to set up a competition between age groups so the next slide um, 
talks a little bit about what the evidence tells us about what we can do about loneliness. Because if we're lonely, when there's a mismatch between the quality and quantity of relationships that we want and those we have, there's three things we can do about it. We can look at the quality of relationships, we can look at the quantity of relationships, or we can look at how we think and feel about those relationships. And those are three areas of potential action on loneliness. So on the next slide, um, I am not going to go through my favorite uh, graphic on loneliness interventions, but I would just uh, endorse the promising approaches to um, reducing loneliness and social isolation in later life uh, report that was produced for the campaign to end loneliness and age UK which talks about the fact that there are things that you can do in that middle part of the diagram on those three areas of action there are things that we already can do and show work around supporting people to change their thinking around improving people's quality and quantity of relationships but if we don't do those with a in the context of a wider web of effective action, effective action to identify lonely individuals, to understand the kinds of things that will make a difference for them as individuals, and to support them to access that support and help in the community, it won't work. If we live in communities where there's no transport or we're disconnected digitally, none of this will work. And if we do things in a way that, are dis that is disempowering, that doesn't enable people as active citizens, then none of this will work. So there, there are many solutions to loneliness and in communities, we need to do things that they are on top of one another to create real action. And so that's what that um, framework is there to show us. There's a couple of other bits of key evidence I just wanna flag up because they're really important when we think about what we can do and what we can't do in the current time around connection. The first is this set of evidence around the kinds of interactions and, and connections that we need to sustain us. Because for a long time we thought about um, weak ties and strong ties and we thought it was really important that people had strong ties, really deep relationships with people and these were what prevented loneliness. And there's some evidence that on average most people have around four deep meaningful connections with people. And so maybe there's a way in which we should encourage people to kind of think about that in the back of their mind, you know, how, how am I four? Do I have four? Do I need to build new relationships? That could be useful. But what we're seeing now is that those things that we thought of as weak ties and probably weren't taking very seriously are quite important. The thin ties, the smile in the street, the nod in the shop, the friendly kind of eyebrow raise with the neighbor when something goes wrong, those are really important to how we feel and how connected we feel and the thing i think is really important to reflect on is the fact that those are some of the things that aren't happening right now and how do we manage that situation when actually we're in a scenario where we might be wearing masks so we can't even see the smiles when we're encouraged to jump away from one another when we see one another on the street what is happening to those thin ties and particularly what is happening to those thin ties for people who are already feeling challenged around their relationships so on the next slide, this diagram, and I would really endorse this report, I do it every time I get the chance by Ambition for Ageing in Greater Manchester. They looked at how the physical spaces in our communities enable our ties to build through those very thin ties, through to deeper connections, then up to the point where we can connect to each other deeply in meaningful activism, engagement, social groups together. And they talked about the places where we pass each other on the street and then we have the first little chat and then we build the connection and we start to, you know, be in the same room as one another and then start to trust each other. All of those things are really challenging right now. So lots of the things we're doing to try to help people stay connected, you know, digital connection, phoning each other up. That's OK, but it's not enabling people who don't have that connection to build slowly. So what can we do about that and how can we think about that for the future? On the next slide. Uh, oh yeah, I'm getting towards the end, but I just wanted to say why this matters. Okay, so this matters because loneliness is really deeply harmful. And the famous uh, piece of evidence is that loneliness and social isolation is as damaging to our health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Some people that, that kind of seems to create a bit of an allergic reaction. If you don't like that, there's no shortage of other evidence around the physical and mental health impacts of loneliness relations to stroke, depression, dementia, heart conditions. And loneliness seems to impact our health both directly, it triggers our stress mechanisms, but also indirectly. Lonely people are less likely to engage in healthy behaviours. So right now, when many of us aren't taking as much exercise as we wanted, we 
you know, when people are really struggling to maintain healthy behaviours because they're lonely, that toxic cycle is likely to be much, much more significant. It's, so it's impacting both our mental and our physical health, but also loneliness grinds us down. So the longer we spend lonely, the worse it gets and the harder it gets to reconnect because there's evidence that lonely people perceive more threat in social situations. So the longer you've been lonely, the more likely you are to find it terrifying, intimidating, worrying to go into a new social situation. I think we need to be really mindful of that, that, that harm that's happening in people right now. But we've got to get this right, because there's also evidence that people who expect to be lonely, and this comes from later life research, people who expect to be lonely in later life are more likely to be lonely in later life. If we set up expectations that loneliness is inevitable, then actually it seems to become more inevitable. Now, obviously, that probably needs a lot of unpacking, but I think it's really interesting and tells us something important about what we should be, um, how we should be communicating around this. And then the final thing was just to land on a few key points that I think come out of the prior evidence we have that we need to be thinking about right now. The first is that loneliness really matters. And so it's very serious. We need to be thinking about how we can address it now and also to be cataloguing those things that we can't do now and working out what we can do in the next phase. It's also true that many of our usual tools are beyond our reach. So we do need to innovate. We need to think about how we can do things to address all of those ranges of connections that we're missing out from the very thin to the very thick ties, particularly for those who didn't have many connections before. We also need to think about who, who may be left behind. And you think about the co correlation between the group who are potentially going to be either left to continue to shield or are going to be feeling more vulnerable in the current situation. And the correlation between that group and the group who are already at risk of loneliness is really, really strong. So we need to think about, as things change for some of us, who is left behind and what are the implications for them. And then I think the other issue is to think about the links between loneliness and all those other complex factors, poverty you know, discrimination and injustice, marginalisation, practical barriers, health barriers and care barriers. These are really, really critical and we cannot address loneliness without being mindful of those other important issues. So that's where I'm going to stop and I'll hand over to Robin, but hopefully that gives you a whistle-stop tour and the slides will be shared and I'm happy to answer any questions in the chat. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kate. That was incredibly, incredibly helpful. Um, so we've now got Robin, who's the Director of Campaigns, Policy and Research at the Campaign Event Loneliness. Great. Yeah. So I was going to start losing my thread here. So we, um, yes, yeah, so I'm here to talk about um, some work we've been doing about what we can do about loneliness uh, in the context of the coronavirus. Um, but just to briefly introduce the campaign. Um, so we were founded nearly 10 years ago to create a focus on loneliness because before it was kind of in various different other places. Um, and what we think we are at our best as an organisation um, is through the kind of fantastic network that we have, um, our ability to engage with different types of organisations, some big national ones, including the government, um, but also smaller local organisations, and also going into the uh, really rich research community that there is uh, on loneliness. Um, and we kind of bring that together in our research and policy hubs that we have four of every year. Um, and some of the insight that we've, that Kate's just been talking about kind of is deepened by, by, by that set of networks. Um, and so, and what, the other thing we do is then try to bring that together uh, in useful research reports, as well as um, particularly kind of accessible documents, um, as I'm just about to start talking about. Um, so in my next slide, um, um, we, so Ayana, could you, um, Is it not updated? No, I've still got loneliness in the time of COVID. Aha, great. So what we did was we had, um, partially just through our general networks, but also through having uh, a couple of webinars that brought um, about 150 different organisations together, a lot of which I can see here. So I hope that you feel that we've done kind of justice to the contributions that you made. We wanted to ask people um, what it is that we already know about loneliness and how are we adapting in this kind of relatively early stage of 
uh, the coronavirus, although we think that particularly for some of the groups that we're most worried about, the effects of it will continue uh, for a long time. Um, to ask them, what would be, what would you say to people who are coming new to this issue? Um, and we kind of created this infographic that talks about the who, the what, and the how. Now, um, that there's quite a lot on that. So fortunately, on my next slide, we can break that down into um, the, those three big segment, segment sections. So in relation to the who, and there's an interesting kind of tension here. So we say both, we talk about groups at risk, but we also say to avoid assumptions. But to talk about the groups at risk of loneliness, um, we, um, Kate has already talked about those, and that there are over um, many years of work, we have relatively developed ideas about the groups, um, about what it is that makes people at risk of loneliness. And some of those are quite objective factors um, that people might be able to pick up from um, local data, but some of them are more personal things like um, things like bereavement or um, or existing loneliness and the way in which it um, it uh, kind of reinforces itself. Um, and then if you have that kind of idea of who to um, of who you should focus on, then I think one of the things that we know about loneliness, particularly in this context, is the value of reaching out uh, and and offering help, and that can be to people who you're already in contact with but it can also be with people who might not already have been um, uh, might not already be in touch with um, and that kind of offer of help in different ways and in friendly ways uh, can be really valuable and depending on your level of resource um, the kind of higher touch obviously um, you can do more um, but finally it's also important that we listen to people and that we don't say well you tick boxes x y and z therefore you must be lonely um the point is, is, is that it's important that we ask people how they're feeling um and uh, and sometimes that might be through talking about loneliness in a really explicit way and sometimes it might be um in a less direct way um and so moving on to our next slide um we uh we've established who it is that we're trying to to reach um but then we can talk about the how and I think that point about avoiding assumptions really illustrates the key issues around the around the how that it's important that we ask open questions and that we give people time to to open up and that we are kind of guided by um, by what they are interested in and what they want to talk about uh, as much as possible um, and I think that this point about providing offline alternatives is, is is an important one. I think it's also something which, from um, I think I think really uh, every one of the 150 organisations we spoke to in the course of developing this was acutely aware um, of the digital divide and the way in which that some people um, have um, have access to the internet and as much of it as they could possibly want and for a lot of people they may have access to the internet but it's really constrained by data packages by the fact they're doing it through pay as you go on their mobile so it's not the case that everyone is either streaming things all the time or offline actually there's a kind of a gradient going through um, but offline alternatives are important as well just because they can be more interesting and more satisfying um, and I think that I'm sure that all of us here will be deeply familiar with Zoom fatigue. Um, and the kinds of things that people were talking about there were particularly sometimes if you can do things at a neighbourhood level, then that can be great. And there's the lovely photo that the Connection Coalition used of someone knocking on someone's window and having a chat through the window, which I think kind of gets to the heart of that fantastically well. Um, but we're just about to be launching a campaign through Be More Us about the value of using the phone. And people love using the phone. I think you can kind of, the kind of quality of being able to listen to someone's voice in real depth um, can be fantastic there. Um, so finally, moving on to the what, um, I think that um, we, I think choice is really important um, because I think that the kind of the thing about loneliness is that it's a serious issue which impacts 
uh, our, our emotional, our physical and mental health really significantly. But what we do about it is generally about bringing together people together around things that are really meaningful to them and that they enjoy. And so um, the range of things we do about loneliness, therefore, is, is tremendously broad. Um, but I think that as well, and a key kind of concern that came through from our webinars was that um, it's important that we, um, if we're involved in running services, that we make them work for people, um, but also that this is not um, some kind of great saviors coming down to help these poor vulnerable people. The point is, is that we is that we should try to make things as, as two way as possible, that we ask people to, to get involved, to make things, to help, to help each other, because those are the things that can be the most meaningful connections. Um, and finally, um, we know that loneliness is impacted by, um, is partially about tackling loneliness, but it is also impacted by other things and it can be useful to link to people who can provide some of those really more kind of physical uh, and practical pieces of support. Um, so this is a kind of a stream of work. We've kind of done the first phase. Um, the next phase is to look in more depth about the challenges and opportunities of digital connection. Um, and it's something that we want to be, um, this is not a, uh, something where we can be completely linear. We're learning as we go along with this. Um, and we'd be very grateful for kind of reflections about what those kind of challenges and opportunities are and ways in which we can kind of practically address them um, in this um, strange and constantly developing time. So um, that do please um, kind of follow us on Twitter or sign up to our mailing lists. Um, and in that way, we can kind of best keep in touch with this work. So, so thank you for listening to me. Um, and I think we now are going to have some opportunities for a bit more conversation rather than talking. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Robin and Kate. Um, I don't know if you could just flip to the slide, that would be great. Thank you. Um, lovely. So, yes, as Robin said, we are now going to go into our breakout groups. So that's a lot of information and I'm sure you've all got lots of questions, reflections. Um, so, yeah, it says 15 minutes there. I've just slightly reduced that in the interest of time um, to about 12 minutes. But just, yeah, these questions, what resonated with you? Did anything surprise you? Um, any kind of reflections and then we'll have about 10 minutes after we come back from the breakout rooms to kind of feed back on that. So um, I suppose it'd probably be easiest. You're going to be in groups of about four to five people if you maybe want to nominate um, someone to feed back on behalf of your group. That would be brilliant. Um, um, so yeah, I hope that was a helpful time for everyone just to have a bit of time to chat and discuss. So we've now got about 10 minutes for um feedback so it would be great if we could just i think we had eight groups um although i'm not actually sure i don't think you guys were given a number so if anybody would like to start um beth i wonder sorry to yeah, no, no, group, but just to get us started you were in breakout group one so i'm happy to feed that um, yeah so i think uh Something that quite resonated with us was talking about um, these assumptions around um, age groups, you know, young people, the older people, which we definitely found was unhelpful, and that focus can also um, miss quite a big group of people. Uh, we had quite a big focus, we talked a bit about future proofing and tools we could provide to young people, which is quite, um, quite a key thing, uh, and tools in terms of uh, enabling people to have those conversations, as was kind of discussed. It's not about saying, do you have enough food? Are you lonely? Kind of ticking a box. What are the um, tips and tools that kind of the language to sort of help people have these kind of conversations um we talked a lot about um linking up around shared interests i think we've seen um there was you know um coming into this pandemic there was a bit of a focus on kind of immediate needs and equipping people but as we kind of move beyond that how can we um, make sure those connections are a bit um more substantive better quality it's not just about uh ticking a box as we said um yeah, and we talked a bit about um, crossover areas. We talked a bit about disability and um, the fact uh, sometimes there can be several factors, you know, from my perspective, talking about um, when disability issues can link over with various armed forces issues. Um, there's certain kind of groups you might need to look at um, who might be facing some quite unique circumstances. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, and just to say to everyone as well, I 
might not be able to reply to everything in the chat, but I am sort of keeping an eye and noting things down that I think um, are things that we can take away to try and find out more answers if we don't have them within the group um, and also to kind of inform our future webinars going forwards as well. Um, so yeah, is there anyone who would like to go next or whether it was one person from a group or just anyone with any general reflections at all? Yeah, happy to Eleanor. Um, Thank you, so some of the things that people agreed with um, or resonated with was the argument about uh, looking at different age groups and the fact that, you know, um, one of the services, Grapevine, um, who uh who spoke basically said that you know they don't discriminate they don't specify with certain age groups they kind of approach everybody and um allow anybody to access their services um which was great to hear um but also they agree sorry if you could just pop yourself on mute oh, sorry. <laughs> you're not speaking <laughs> um, sorry Rusty. Then, don't worry um and then also uh the point of transitions also resonated um so jeremy uh spoke about the asylum seekers that they work with and obviously they go they have been going to new countries um they're new to the area so you know loneliness does occur uh, more so with them because it's such a massive change in their life periods um but also it's the quality and quantity of relationships that people also um agreed that you know that's that's how how it sort of comes about um and the last thing was um the lack to lack of access to digital resources um with kind of everything going on at the moment um over the past few months it's it's become really apparent who is struggling in this area who um doesn't have access to internet who can't afford a smartphone um and people that are being left behind um and that was sort of one of the areas that was more, uh, was not so surprising, so to speak, but um, that we also spoke about were the left behind groups um, mm -hmm. that we can kind of foresee struggling more so than others, um, whether that's because of digital exclusion or whether that's because uh, they're suffering from bereavement, um, people sending their children to school or nursery who can't do so. Um, and... Uh, also the health aspects i think some people weren't aware kind of how uh, how much of a clinical impact loneliness has in terms of um, alzheimer's and stroke and, and everything mm. like that so yeah i do think that um thank you so much Rashi, and loads of really important points that i do think just what you're saying on the last one about people not necessarily connecting the clinical aspects i think is a really um important point as well for when you know if we're, if we're possibly sometimes working with people that maybe don't understand the importance of it and it can help you know to be making that case um but yes would anybody else like to share any reflections at all um before we move on um i'm jane from uh, group three we didn't um have a, a spokesperson as such but i was told i was going to be spokesperson right at the end um so one thing we did actually just um made us think was the fact um with regard to the ties um and the thin ties the people that we sort of um, put our hand up to in the street etc um i very much feel from the um service that we've been offering over the last couple of months that the thin ties are very much heading towards the thicker ties now um because these sort of you know nods and um etc are the ones that have turned into the people supporting their local community we found in our area and hopefully that will continue so that is obviously supported people with their loneliness yeah that's brilliant thank you jane um and just on a personal level that's definitely something that i've also noticed um in my local area as well so it's, it's really great to hear that that's kind of feeling more across the board as well um, so, was there anybody else that wanted to share anything at all? Yeah, happy. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, the problem. I can't actually see anyone, so I can't see if you're no, waving at me. Sorry about that. Um, David, if you'd like to go for it, that would be great. Yeah, I could just add a couple of points. Um, one was just about the technology and how, um, I guess, difficult at the moment when you can't sit with anyone, it is to actually kind of um, digitally include people um, effectively when they're not used to using digital um, methods 
And um, we talked a bit about measurement of loneliness as well and how difficult that is and how potentially it gets in the way of delivering services. If you're constantly asking how people are, um, it might put people off or annoy people, but how then do you um, reflect the change? So we talked about um, potentially um, moving it as like a, a journey um, that people go on and uh, is trying to kind of encapsulate everything, not just the kind of loneliness element. Um, but the rest of the stuff is kind of being covered already. Great, thank you. And just to say as well, I um, can't remember if I mentioned this before, but we are looking at um, holding a specific webinar around measuring loneliness as well. So we'll hopefully be able to go into that in quite a bit more detail there and then to so look out for that one. And then was, um, I think somebody else was going to speak before as well. Yeah, just, uh, yes. yeah, just very briefly, it's also about the technology that um, in our group we discussed that there have been positives as well as negatives. And one of the positives was that um, young people who do have social anxiety have been able to join groups online uh, mm -hmm. with confidence. And also um, where there's people who've got long term health that have, they're not able to get out, have also been able to join groups online. Um, and we've seen that as a real positive impact. Um, and the danger is that they stop once you get back together again. So you begin to isolate people who you've included. So it's making sure the plan involves them going forward. Yeah, definitely. Um, brilliant. OK, I think just in the interest of time, we'll have to leave it there. But please do keep um, adding any thoughts, reflections, questions, think things that would be helpful for us to be thinking about as well and um, that we can maybe support on um, into the chat box. So I think, Iona, if you're right, just skip on to the next slide or two. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so now we have um, Anne Osborne, who's the CEO of the Rural Coffee Caravan, um, who's going to share a bit more about her local work in Suffolk. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, the, the Rural Coffee Caravan. <laughs> so it's a very quirky, off-the-wall um, project, which I have... Um, a devil of a job fitting into funding applications and have done for 17 years but we've managed to keep going for that long which is pretty phenomenal um, and we address rural isolation so this need was identified um, just about 20 years ago in Suffolk by somebody who worked for the farm crisis network through foot and mouth and she realized when she was talking to people on helplines that people in rural areas didn't really know where to go for information and didn't know what it was they didn't know and uh, in the conversations that she was having she realized that actually they were very lonely as well so she set off with a caravan full of cake and biscuits and leaflets and coffee and just went out to these places that she'd identified to meet these people and just give them the hand of friendship really um, and it developed from there so we now have three mobile community cafes which are just camper vans or caravans they're not adapted in any way you could go on a holiday in them they're, they're just ordinary camper vans and um, we spend by, by invitation we're invited by villagers to come and spend a couple of hours to enable neighbors to get together so it's a social space in a rural place um, and, and non-threatening very welcoming and easily accessible for everybody and the idea is that we just have a very informal get together but they get the opportunity to talk, to talk about what they would like to do in their village so what's strong rather than what's wrong what they would like to see happen um, and they gradually make relationships and well friendships the relationships build into friendships and then we can support them with any ideas they have of what they would like to do going forward but the conversations that we have are always uh, the villages that we go to and the conversations that we have they've lost their social amenities they either have a village hall that isn't used or they don't have a village hall they don't have a shop they don't have a pub they've had public transport cut and without any of those things there's no casual connection so you you don't unless you walk a dog you don't know the chap clipping his hedge in, in number three or you don't know who lives in the house with the blue roof or those nodding casual connections that actually are a really vital part of people's life don't exist if people feel they have no reason to go out and we meet people who are sitting waiting for their daughter to drop around and take them to Tesco's for their fortnightly shop or whatever this is in normal times obviously um, and from doing this work over over the number of years that we have been we've we've come to realize that actually loneliness is everybody's business and we've included now networks that bring in 
the local shop because they are often the only point of contact if there is one and we are seeing a rise in community shops which is wonderful um, to get them to recognize how important they are and maybe offer a little bit more in the way of friendship so maybe a coffee machine or a bench outside or a book swap or a recipe swap or something like that and then two years ago we started a network called meetup mondays which some of you may have heard of which is asking pubs and cafes if they will hold a free coffee morning for a couple of hours once a week on a Monday. And we chose Monday because weekends can be very dark for lonely people and you won't get a commercial business to do anything on a weekend, but they might do it in a very quiet time on a Monday morning. I have to say we have meet up Mondays on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, all, the, all over the, the week, but they are amazingly successful. And one of the things that's come out of that <clears throat> is something that somebody was talking about a bit earlier in that People can be very afraid to go into village hall activities if they've become very lonely for a long time or if they've lived alone for a long time. Going into somewhere where they believe that everybody already knows each other is extremely difficult. So meet up Mondays in a pub. The pub belongs to everybody. It's the landlord issuing the invitation. And we know from talking to people that that's made a huge difference to some folk. They feel they can go into the pub on their own because the landlord, landlady, whoever has invited them. And the feedback from Meetup Mondays is amazing. We just keep hearing this has changed my life all the time. But we're, we're talking about, um, before I get on to talking about evaluations, I want to talk a bit about hidden loneliness because loneliness we know is incredibly hard to measure. And for a lot of people, they don't realize that they are lonely or they're guilty, so they won't admit it or they feel embarrassed. Um, or, or they've just been accepting. They've lost their partner. They expected they accepted to be being lonely. I've got a couple of little case histories or little quick stories about examples of this. We, we met a lady who um, had been moved into a lovely village by her son, who runs the local pub. It is a, it's a touristy village, so it has got quite a lot of amenities. Her daughter um, in law, she gets on with really well. Her granddaughter works in the pub and her granddaughter has a child as well. So she has all these generations of people in this village. It's a very small village. I happened to ask her how she was and she burst into tears. And she didn't want to tell me, but we got talking and she said, I'm lonely. And I, I know that nobody can understand that I'm lonely because I've got all my family around me, but I've lived all my life in Kings Lynn. My husband is buried in Kings Lynn. My sister still lives in Kings Lynn. I know how to walk around Kings Lynn. I know the bus routes. I just miss all that familiarity. And I don't like to bother my family in the evenings or, or on the weekends. So she was actually a really lonely person where everybody else thought that she was very well connected. Um, so that's one example. Another example was, was a lady who said to me in a Meetup Monday, I said, oh, you do enjoy coming along to the Meetup Monday? She said, oh, yeah, but I'm not lonely. So I said, well, that's fine. It's, it's just for anybody who wants to come along and make friendships um, and for people who spend too much time on their own looking at the same four walls. And she said, oh, yes, I do that. So she wasn't recognising her loneliness as, as we would recognize her loneliness. Another lady who told me that um, her husband had died six months previously and she goes out regularly to the shop and the bank, but she doesn't do anything else without him. She didn't really expect that she would, but she's been brought along to the pub, to the meetup Monday. And I'm not quite sure of the connection, but she's now learning to play the ukulele. And so her life had opened up completely in a way that she hadn't expected it to. Um, and we hear stories like this just all the time, to be honest, this, this hidden loneliness, this, this uh, carers who don't even realize they're carers, you know, it's just the way they live their life, but actually they're very lonely. Um, so before I get onto how we've adapted, evaluation, we've talked a lot about evaluation and I have to say that I do not and will not use any of the forms that say, have you, are you lonely some of the time, all the time, etc because our whole ethos is one of um, non-invasive, non-threatening. You know, the, the changes that we act as a catalyst for happen at the speed of trust. And we feel that, that to ask these deeply personal questions goes against that. We have lots of icebreaker questions that, like what's your favorite music, can, can tell you loads about a person once they start on that. So we use stories, we use testimonies, we have a visitor's book, we have videos, we, we 
collect all the data of who's there, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't use any of those forms. And actually, I've managed to train all our funders not to expect it now and to appreciate soft outcomes. And we do go out of our way to capture absolutely everything that we have made a difference, you know, that our presence there has made a difference. We do try to capture absolutely everything. So as you can imagine, we're a face-to-face -face service. So overnight, COVID stopped that for us. <clears throat> we looked around immediately um, and set up telephone trees. We sent a model out to all our communities to set up telephone trees. Um, they're, they're working really well and we've had feedback to say that some people who had never spoken to anybody that they're in the telephone tree with before are now looking forward to meeting up in real life when they can. So that's worked really well. Lots of people under 30 when we said telephone tree said, sorry, what? But for us, of course, for us older people, telephone trees were, were what was in existence before email. So actually they're quite um, common and we're making sure that people use them as talking trees, not just what do you need for your shopping. We looked around and we saw that everybody else was doing, all the, all the infrastructure and local authority organisations were doing the COVID info. So we thought well, there's no point in getting involved in that. So our website is the most amazing in um, isolation inspiration page. And our calendar is full of virtual and TV and radio events. So they didn't look like it was cancelled, 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 cancelled. So it's absolutely chock-a-block with things to do. Our vans are going out, but they're not, we're not doing visits. They're just going to our villages with huge bunches of flowers. And we're putting little bunches of flowers on the doorsteps of people that we know are not online. Um, and we're just making ourselves available for long distance chats. So, so people can see that we're out and about. We've also given our vehicles over for the collection of prescriptions and shopping and, and that kind of thing. Um, and we are having as many conversations with people as we can that, that are not online. We've developed newsletters that are going out and we're asking the people who are receiving them to share that information. Um, and we're just doing the best we can, to be honest. It's very difficult for a service like us to adapt. But, and, and just one little thing about making it easier, we're capturing all this amazing neighbourliness, it's just incredible. We need to hold on to this and move it forward. And I would really like to know if when governments are assessing new policy, I know they have to do impact assessments, I know there's templates for that, are they actually including the effect on community? Because a lot of communities now have the potential to be so much stronger and we need to make it easy for people living in those communities to do stuff for themselves. We need to be reducing red tape um, and we need to make it um, like people power. We need to recognise that communities can do things for themselves and ask for help when they need it rather than having to accept it top down all the time. So I would like to know very much if, if the effect on community is something that is taken into account in developing policy. Sorry, that was a million miles an hour. Uh, have I gone over? No, that was brilliant. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, it was really fantastic to kind of hear the range of how things were before, how you've adapted. And I think actually your last um, point as well around kind of policy and communities actually leads us on very nicely to Restine, who's our next speaker um, from the British Red Cross as well. Um, so, Iona, are you all right to just go to the next slide? Please. There we go. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so yes, welcome Rustin. Hi everybody. That was such a nice presentation, Anne. Um, very peaceful one from you. I can't think of a better job than uh, driving around in a caravan and meeting people and making their days. Um, so I'm Rustin. I am the Policy and Public Affairs Officer um, in the policy research and advocacy team at the British Red Cross um, and my specific policy area is loneliness and social isolation. Um, so I provide the Secretariat to the Loneliness Action Group which is how potentially some of you might know me um, and we have been doing that for the last couple of years um, but I also provide the Secretariat to the APPG on loneliness as well. Um, as Kate uh, very well uh, articulated, uh, loneliness is so important for so many different reasons, um, for health reasons, um, for an amalgamation of other reasons as well. Um, but obviously um, for the Red Cross, um, our mission to tackle loneliness hasn't been so important in such a long time. 
um, you know, we our research found that before the coronavirus emergency, one in five people across the UK felt always or often lonely, which is, you know, it's so common. We um, before that we had no idea how how common it was. Um, and uh, the APBG on loneliness is what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, so that is the all party parliamentary group on loneliness. Um, there's actually about, I think, a thousand different APPGs on a bunch of different uh, topics that MPs and peers are really interested in. Um, and loneliness is one of them. Um, and they are uh, a, apolitical is the wrong word, but politically neutral um groups that are cross-party so you have to have for example someone from the Labour Party someone else um to balance it out um and the APG on loneliness specifically was established by Rachel Reeves um with the support of the British Red Cross and co-op um and um a dedicated group of really passionate um officers to build on the success of the Joe Cox Commission on loneliness um, and the whole point of this APPG is basically to ensure uh, that people are supported throughout their whole lives to have the meaningful connections, that social connections um, of their choosing by influencing government policy and practice, which um, Anne just touched on very well there. Um, this APPG in particular is very cross-party. Um, although it has a Conservative chair, we've got um, some great Labour MPs that sit on it, so Ellie Reeves um, and uh, Barry Shearman, who's been standing for like 15 years, um, but we've also got some really influential politicians in there, so former Secretary of State Karen Bradley, um, Health and Care Select Committee member um, Dean Russell, um, and Lord Barwell, who was um, an advisor to Theresa May at number 10. Um, I think in this in the short time frame that we've all been working on loneliness i know you know some of us have only been doing it for six months for a year or two years of, as we said from the beginning we've actually achieved quite a lot um so uh, for example the appointment of the world's first minister for loneliness who is baroness baron um and uh the fact that she has now several dedicated government funds to tackle loneliness um which is amazing um and government strategy uh, which sets out 60 commitments from nine different government departments. Um, so we've come a really long way and that wouldn't have happened unless, you know, we'd all banded together and tried our very best to achieve everything that we have done. Um, now, the APPG um, this year launched an independent inquiry into loneliness. It's uh, modelled off a select committee inquiry, so to speak, um, and the whole point of this inquiry has been to hold government to account. You know, it's fine them um, making these 60 pledges, but we need to make sure that they're committed to those um, and that loneliness is tackled through them. Um, secondly, uh, the whole point of the inquiry is to build on the progress made to date. Um, and for us at the end of it to recommend tangible and really ambitious next steps for government at the end of the inquiry. Um, we're hoping this will be December 2020, but we don't we don't know now with sort of um COVID-19 if that will be the case um but that is the sort of timeline that we are sticking to um and through this consultation period that we had um we are developing uh new solutions um to four crucial policy areas um that the loneliness action group actually identified within the shadow report um which is called a connected society assessing progress in tackling loneliness um, and these are the four policy areas that they thought we need to focus on are the most um important um to tackle loneliness moving forward um so this inquiry closed uh in in may uh, at the beginning of may um and the four policy areas that we're exploring are um what Anne was talking about actually which is how to test the implications of government policy on loneliness um, so designing and implementing different ways to do that um, secondly um, translating national policy into local action through local authorities um, and exploring what the role of local authorities are in tackling loneliness um, third of all we're looking at community infrastructure uh, and that's some of the stuff we've talked about today. So transport, community transport, public transport, public spaces, how to use them, um, 
housing, how housing should be best designed um, to enable those key connections to be made that we've also been talking about, especially with the with the ties analogy, which is great. Um, and lastly, uh, I think it's the section that we all want to know the most about is how we need to fund or how we can fund the voluntary and community sector better, um, because that's where all of these amazing services um, operate and it is how social prescribing um, works in the UK. Um, so uh, at the end of this inquiry we will present all of these recommendations to government um, uh, at the end. Um, we, are, we received about just over 200 responses to the inquiry which I think some of you today uh, responded to which was amazing so thank you so much for the time that you put into those um, and about a half of um, the, the responses were from people like you so volunteering com community sector organizations that are working on the ground to tackle loneliness which is fantastic we also had um, quite a significant fraction from the general public as well so it'd be great to kind of hear what the challenges are for you know uh, people across the UK as well. Um, the next steps of this inquiry um, are oral evidence sessions. Um, so these will be held with MPs and peers from the uh, from the group. Um, so Neil O'Brien is the chair, and he'll be um, leading the way for this. Um, and they'll be taking place ahead of summer recess, ahead of um, parliamentary recess, which is in July. Um, and Neil has been you know a really great advocate for loneliness actually um obviously Rachel Reeves established the group but he's been really passionate just because um he basically he realized how commonplace loneliness is um when he was running to be an MP because when he was knocking on doors he saw for himself how important those those two minutes or those five minutes um of conversation um, were for the people because he was probably the only person that they would speak to for that week or potentially that month. Um, so he's really passionate about it from a personal level as well. Um, so moving away slightly from the APPG, we launched um, the report that Eleanor referenced, which is Barriers to Belonging, um, uh, last year. So it was uh, Loneliness Week last year that we, we received this um, and it found some really stark findings where there were certain groups of society that were more susceptible to loneliness um, and this kind of starts to dig out the reasons behind that um, so for example 67% uh, of the people that responded to the um, to the polling said that they didn't that, who felt that they didn't belong to their community said that they were often or always lonely compared to 16% who felt that they did belong um, so that was a massive kind of discrepancy there and, and really highlighting the importance of feeling like you belong. Um, and um, the report basically found that discrimination, things like bullying, um, disrespect, all increase feelings of loneliness. Um, so things like racism, discrimination and xenophobia, all, um, all extra triggers that people um, experience um, and we found that have really been overlooked in this space as well um, and the most concerning thing is that 31 percent um, of black African respondents hadn't had not experienced any type of discrimination whereas 74 percent of white British respondents um, uh, had not um, so there's a massive gap there obviously uh, showing that there is a particular uh, group in society or particular people from certain backgrounds that are more likely to be uh, lonely because of you know some really um, horrific experiences that they will encounter in their lives um, and a year on from barriers to belonging um, we have been working on a new advocacy report which is drawing on some very new findings from the last couple months um, and we have it's it's quite um, a meaty report that I can't give too much away on at the moment um, but we are basically looking at some more statistics um, and insights um, and this is from a collective polling um, by Opinion uh, which is nationally representative so our report will be um, drawing on all of those findings um, and we'll be releasing that um, at the end of loneliness week um, 
this month. So there's lots to look out for. Um, but we've, we've been doing a lot of the same things as you guys, adapting our services, moving to telephones. Um, uh, another thing that we've been doing quite similar to you, Anne, was that um, we've been dropping off plant pots for these people that we that we help so they can kind of, um, sorry, plants, house plants, so they can kind of nurture them and watch them grow. And it gives them something else to look forward to on a regular basis. Um, we've been uh, sharing exercise packs, so what people can do at home. Um, these people are really the most vulnerable people who don't really have anybody at all. Um, so it's really small stuff like this, which doesn't cost much. It doesn't require much energy or resource. Um, is so, so impactful. And that's what our insight has also shown, you know, is how beneficial all of these um, tiny acts of kindness are. Yeah, um, that's so brilliant. Thank you so much, Christine, for all of your contributions. I'm just aware we've got about five minutes left. So I'm really sorry to have to... Sorry, I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, 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 it was me. Um, so yeah, I think some really fascinating points of what you've just shared. And I think we've had such a great... Um, broad range from really local grassroots experience to the whole policy angle and what we can do there um, and I think it just goes to show as well how you were saying so many people have fed into the consultations and that kind of thing um, the power that we have as a collective as well to be amplifying these issues and really pushing for change and um, so I would really encourage everyone to um, look at the British Red Cross and the work that they're doing more and join up where you can um, and we will also make sure to share links to various pieces of research and whatnot in the follow-up after the webinar. Um, so I'm just, I think Iona is just gonna give us a couple of minutes just to give some practical um, activations, which I think you all may have heard about in different calls, but just to remind everyone um, what we've got coming up. Thanks, Ellie. Hello, my name is Iona. Um, I've met some of you already. Um, I'm helping the Joe Cox Foundation and the Connection Coalition out uh, and by getting it all off the ground with Ellie and a handful of others. So to finish with, um, yes, I think the first thing I'd like to say is, as Ellie just used the word, we are a collective. Um, and if, for those of you who joined one of the webinars recently with all members, you might have heard Kim Ledbeater, Joe Cox's sister, talk about how for Joe, there, there was this kind of need to make sure that all collective efforts on loneliness, as much as any issue, was focused on not just the big power of like large national organizations like the Red Cross and all of the brilliant work they lead on policy, but also by the everyday small community organizations and then everything in between. And that it was by coming together with all of those different sizes and scales and types of organizations that Joe really saw like meaningful progress being able to be made on loneliness. So I suppose that the, the, the thing I would finish by, and I'm, if anyone's been on a webinar before you'll have heard me say this we need to hear from you like and we need to hear from you on like two main things number one what do you want to share today came about because we know that Kate Jopling and Robin and Anne and Rustine had um lots of work that they wanted to share and we just pulled them together made them a powerpoint promoted it to you and then 35 of you turned up fantastic but we know that this is just the beginning so what are you sitting on what gold mine of of experience or insight are you sitting on that you're dying to share like you don't have to have written a snazzy report in order to do it we'd love to hear it so tell us what you'd like to share and secondly tell us what you'd like to learn how can how can we help open doors to the things that you on your own are struggling to work out and we heard today in the small breakout room i was in that there are some offline tools that you know people are going to start sharing to build connection with people who don't have access to internet that's just one example of a million ways in which we can connect you but we'd love to hear from you on your questions um so um coming up in june bunch of stuff really exciting you should we've only got two minutes left but you should definitely check out number one the big lunch coming up this weekend is a chance to uh bring neighbors together anything goes uh with the big lunch it's i think people they're saying cheers to volunteers and they're getting ready to natter and you can pick up the phone anyway check out their website then the wonderful amy amy at the loneliness awareness week uh, organization marmalade trust is doing uh, all she can to bust the stigma around loneliness so check out her resources in the week running up to the great get together and the great get together is the annual 
community celebration, I suppose, um, that uh, sits on what would have been Joe's birthday, uh, 40-something birthday, I can't remember very annoyingly. But um, yes, lots of ways in which you can bring, get together with your neighbours and uh, do everything at a, an appropriate distance. So just some dates for your diary, do get involved, have a look at the websites. Um, and uh, yes, the other and only final thing to say is that um, you will be receiving an email at the early, in the early stages of next week about a campaign called Community Makes Us. Now, for those of you who've joined a big webinar, you'll have heard a bit about that. But essentially, it's a way for us to come together and amplify all of the ways in which social connections and social relationships are supporting people through the good times and the tough times at this moment in time. We'd love you to have a look at using it and We've got to have some webinars to help you use it if you uh, want to. But yes, community makes us. I don't have any time to say what it involves, but yes, keep an eye out for it. And uh, it's been great to see you all today, uh, here today. So back to you, Ellie, in order to finish up. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Iona. So yes, sadly, we are out of time. Um, but as I said before, we will be sharing as comprehensive, comprehensive a follow-up as we can with various links and signposting to different things so do look after uh, look out for that and again just to say a massive thank you to everyone for um sharing your time with us today i know you're all incredibly busy um, and we really appreciate it um and yes i hope everyone is doing well get in touch with us as iona said if you've got ideas thoughts reflections um we want to hear it all um, so yes, we'll bring it to a close there, but thank you so much everyone and we will speak to you all again soon, I'm sure. So thank you and thank you, Ellie. Thank you, Speaker. Bye.